Good evening, everyone. My name is Eric Flesch, and I'm the director of the Mining and Rollo Jameson Museums. Uh, welcome to the second of seven presentations as part of the 2023 Winter Lyceum. Today is the 26th day of February 2023, and I'm broadcasting from Platteville, Wisconsin, home of the world's largest letter M in the heart of the Driftless area in a special place known as the Upper Mississippi Valley Lead and Zinc Mining Region where the Badger State was born. Founded in 1965 by the city of Platteville, the museum brings to life a rich cultural heritage rooted in local history, a tradition of science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, and the celebration of the pioneering spirit, which we recognize to be the living human spirit of ingenuity, inquiry, enterprise, and development. This year's Winter Lyceum promises to be a truly electrifying series of seven presentations. The subjects of the talks range from adaptive reuse of historic mines, to high-tech battery manufacturing, to organic farming, to creating artistic geometric abstractions from nature in the manner of Frank Lloyd Wright. But they all share a theme, and that's the subject of place-based energy in the context of our driftless area landscape and current events. I invite you to stay up to date on museum programs and to support current initiatives online at www.mining.jameson.museum. It's my great pleasure to welcome you this evening to enjoy a discussion by four expert panelists moderated by Platteville's own Amy Seaboth Wilson, titled Mining for Energy, the story of Southwest Wisconsin's electricity journey. The views and opinions expressed in this discussion are those of the speakers do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of any organization or agency. I'd like to thank all of you who have registered to participate live today, as well as those who may be watching a recording of this event from our library of virtual programs. I extend a warm welcome to our current Friends of the Museum members and donors, and I'd like to thank the sponsors whose financial support has made this program possible. a w Restaurant of Platteville, Claire Bank, Edward Jones Financial Advisor Bob Hundhausen, Inspiring Community, Southwest Health, State Farm Agent Jordan Holthouse, and Tricor Insurance. And now, before we begin our program, I'd like to invite you to participate in a question and answer session and a survey at the end of this evening's presentation. Because we're a large group online and in the interest of time, I'd like to invite you to type out your questions as they come to mind and to submit them via the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen during the talk. At the end, the speaker, speakers will be uh, able to answer as many of the questions as they're able in the order in which they are received. So I'm now pleased to introduce the moderator of tonight's panel discussion, who will introduce the rest of our guests. Amy Seaboth Wilson is board president for the nonprofit Renew Wisconsin, director of grants for Southwest Wisconsin Technical College, known locally as Southwest Tech, and former sustainability coordinator for the University of Wisconsin Platteville. A passionate advocate for advancing sustainability, Amy drives a full electric vehicle and has solar on her roof where she lives in Platteville, Wisconsin with her husband and two sons. Please join me in welcoming Amy Seaboth Wilson. Hi everybody, uh, Eric, thank you so much for that introduction and for inviting us to be a part of the talk tonight. I'm really excited to be here. And um, in a second, I'll, I'll hand over the mic, the proverbial mic to the panelists. And first, I just wanna take a minute to talk about why we're talking about energy here in Southwest Wisconsin. I moved here to Southwest Wisconsin to Platteville in 2008. And so now over the 14 or so years I've lived here, it's been really a wild journey to look at where we began the conversation related to renewable energy to where we are today. When I first moved here, I remember reading the news that there were some wind farms being proposed in Lafayette County and they didn't go in. Um, a lot has happened over those 14 years. So just by looking around us, you can tell there's been a shift. And I think um, it's been really interesting to follow the different decisions that have been made, policy, um, technology, social decisions along the way for how those changes occurred and why they occurred the way they were. So when Eric asked, if he thought we could put together a panel about our energy journey, I thought this would be a really interesting moment in time to talk about where we began in that energy journey and where we are today since so much has happened in a relatively short period of time. So basically, if we're gonna put this into that mining framework, 
I think it's really fascinating to think about how we used to be an importer of energy and now we've begun to become an exporter of energy and a producer of energy. And along with that, I start to ask all kinds of questions about why here, why now, what, who's using our energy that we're creating? Are we making enough energy for us to be using locally? Are we still importing energy? What's the sources of our energy? I start going down a rabbit hole of all kinds of interesting questions and made me think that if I'm asking these types of questions, I imagine a lot of other people would be curious to know as well. So I was pretty excited when I began asking some folks that I knew if they'd be willing to do a panel with us, they said yes. And so tonight here we have um, four experts in different aspects of energy in Southwest Wisconsin that can each speak to a different project or set of issues. Um, we have two representatives here from the, the developer side. So we have Cooper Johnson here, and he will be able to talk about um, the, the Badger Hollow Solar Project up by Livingston Montfort. And he's with Invenergy, he's the Renewable Energy, sorry, Renewable Senior Manager of Renewable, I'm gonna stumble here, Renewable Development with Invenergy. Then we also have Michael Golf. He's the Upland Winds project developer with Pattern Energy, and Upland Winds is a wind farm in the Lafayette County area, and he'll be able to talk more about that project. We have a local resident, um, Robert Vosberg, who's the owner of Vosberg Consulting. Uh, he and I serve on the Platteville Planning Commission together, and it was pretty exciting when I realized, to me, I was really excited to realize we have an expert here right in Platteville who works for the transmission industry. And um, obviously Robert will be able to talk more about this than I will, but I think a really important and interesting aspect of our energy is how does it come into our region and how does it leave our region? And uh, many of you may be familiar with Cardinal Hickory Creek, a really large utility transmission project cutting through this district right now going up. And so Robert can talk a little bit more about why we have a project like that and what, what type of transmission elements are necessary for our energy. And then finally, uh, we have finally, last but not least, Andrew Kell will be joining us or is joining us and he's policy director for Renew Wisconsin, uh, the nonprofit that Eric mentioned I'm serving as board president of right now. Renew has been around for about 20, 30 years. I should know the answer to that. Andrew, you can hit on that when it comes to your question or your time. Um, but they advocate, Renew advocates for renewable energy specifically. And um, I, Andrew's gonna be able to contextualize renewable energy into a larger statewide portfolio of energy for us. So I'm very excited to see everybody here tonight. Um, I'm super excited that these experts are gonna be able to talk a little bit about what's going on and why. They each have five minutes roughly to present. And then we're gonna switch over to some Q&A uh, moderated with Eric. And I have a few questions that I'm gonna be asking as well. So get your questions ready. All right, so with no further ado, we're gonna begin with Cooper, again, Senior Manager for Renewable Development with Invenergy. And he's here representing Badger Hollow Solar. All right, uh, everybody help me welcoming Cooper. Yeah, thank you, Amy, and uh, thanks to Eric. It's really exciting to be here, um, speak with you all tonight, and talk about all of the exciting things that are happening in Southwest Wisconsin with uh, regard to energy. Um, so I've been working in renewables in Wisconsin for about 12 years. I got my start um, at Helio Solar Works, building solar panels in the uh, Menominee River Valley on Canal Street. And um, since then I've installed solar um, on the distributed side for commercial residential installations. And I've had the opportunity to work for a distributor. I've, uh, I worked at Inga Team, which is a wind turbine generator manufacturer. I ran the service crews there. So three years um, working with those fellas, keeping wind turbines running and solar um, producing clean power across the US. But for the past three and a half years, I've been um, here at Invenergy, working almost exclusively in Wisconsin, mostly solar, but definitely some wind going on here. Um, for those who aren't familiar, Invenergy is uh, the world's leading sustainable energy provider. We've got over 20 years developing our core business, which is large scale utility solar, um, wind and storage projects. 
Um, we're also, we've got some transmission business and uh, clean hydrogen or green hydrogen, clean water projects, but uh, mostly the, the bread and butter of what we've been doing as a uh, developer, owner, and operator of these large projects are those um, projects that you, um, Amy mentioned here, the Badger Hollow Solar Project, among others. Um, but here in Wisconsin, we've been uh, in business for about 15 years. We uh, permitted and constructed and started operating the Forward Wind Energy Center in Dodge and Fond du Lac counties. It's part of a uh, portfolio of four projects over a thousand megawatts of uh, clean power here in Wisconsin that's generating nearly $8 million a year in tax revenues, wages to employees, and annual land and rental payments to local farmers. Um, we've brought a lot of construction jobs during construction of those projects, and some folks in southwest Wisconsin are familiar with some of those um, heads and beds and other local construction benefits from the Badger Hollow Solar Project. So specifically here in southwest Wisconsin, that's probably where you're going to know Invenergy best from. Um, we are building a 300 megawatt solar project uh, that's generating enough, or generating $1.2 million annually in local tax revenues that are supporting um, you know, school, fire, EMS, and um, road and infrastructure projects in Southwest Wisconsin. We expect to be online and operational fully uh, this year. And uh, yeah, just give a scope uh, scale for these large scale uh, projects here. It's 300 megawatts is enough to power about 58,000 homes with uh, the solar project. I'm also um, proud to chat a little bit about our other efforts here in um, Southwest Wisconsin. We're developing a project that has not yet been permitted, but we expect to start that permitting process later this year. Um, we're calling it Badger Hollow Wind. Um, that's the brand out here in Iowa County. Um, this is a up to 139 megawatt wind project that could bring 560,000 additional dollars annually to um, the counties and townships. That's enough power for 43,000 homes. And if we can uh, permit the project, uh, we hope to be operational by 2026. So I'm um, very excited to be here to answer some questions. And again, thank you to Amy and Eric for hosting us here today. Very excited about what's happening and how far we've come in the past 12 years up here in Wisconsin. Thanks, Cooper. Um, all right, next we're gonna hear from Michael and keep up. I'm seeing some questions come in. Everybody feel free to keep putting questions into that chat box while, while you listen to our presenters. All right, Michael, I'll hand the mic over to you. I appreciate it. And I, uh, I echo Cooper. I appreciate being a part of this and, and being invited to the stage today. Uh, and it's, it's exciting to see uh, as we continue to develop things out in Wisconsin, the activity in the community and uh, also the interest in what we're doing. So from my standpoint, I, I really, uh, I've enjoyed the interactions uh, that I have had with uh, landowners and stakeholders and, and uh, state members of the state that are, are driving development forward. So I, uh, I appreciate that and appreciate the invite first and foremost. My background is, is uh, somewhat unique. I've worked internationally for a number of years uh, related to electronic discovery and legal matters. I retired from that field and started a little over four years ago in the renewable energy field. That was the, the choice that I made, uh, knowing that I have uh, three children that I get to look at when I go home and say, you know what, I did something good for you tonight and uh, made a difference in your future. I may not see the benefits of what we do, and the developments we make uh, in my lifetime, but it plays out much longer term than I, I may ever be alive. Pattern energy is, is unique. Uh, we are in the process of building the second largest wind farm on the planet in uh, the state of New Mexico. That's where I've spent my most recent last four years developing the, the, that project, as well as uh, the uh, largest and longest HVDC line that will be built on land of extending 550 miles long, uh, transporting electricity from a wind farm into the, into the grid effectively. And Pattern has been around since 2009, developing projects like the Sunzia project that I am I'm just, uh, just finishing up and going into uh, construction. The size and what we're doing in Wisconsin falls in alignment with what Pattern does. 
And pattern is uh, ultimately hoping to be, as we've been in the past and as we hope to be in the future, good neighbors. We uh, have the opportunity to come into communities like the, the Southern Wisconsin area and work with landowners and identify a, a good fit for the community as well as for the state and develop out projects like Upland's Wind. Upland Wind itself is a uh, 300 megawatts, two 300 megawatt wind farms that will uh, plug into and utilize the Cardinal Hickory Creek line that you mentioned earlier, Amy, and we'll utilize that in order to transport that electricity, hopefully into the state of Wisconsin as our hope. And we'd like to develop that out and continue to work in the state of Wisconsin, not just to develop wind and solar, but also support storage facilities. Uh, those are things that we've developed elsewhere. And we found that that's something that we have, that have found a, a really good, a really good fit in the state of Wisconsin. And we like to, we like to develop that out in uh, the efforts and in the focus with Wisconsin, where the, the focus has been really to get to zero carbon footprint. It's really a, a fun process to see a state that's committed to that and uh, the community that's committed to, de to, to developing it that direction. And we look forward to being a part of that. Uh, our hope is over the, the course of the next uh, few years, as this project develops out and as we invest in the community and you know, overall the, the project itself, it's a billion dollars. Uh, we hope that the community benefits, you know, so upwards of $72 million over the lifetime of the project will go to good use. Uh, we in Wisconsin, we need, we need projects like this, not just for those construction jobs that are temporary, but the long-term jobs too. Amy, you'd mentioned, and, and Cooper kind of alluded to it as well. We export a lot of things. Uh, we export our, our, our farm, you know, all the agricultural, our, we export our, our kids. And so to have good high paying jobs that ultimately will be there for a long, long time to come gives us the incentive to, to keep our, our kids around and also contribute to the communities. Thank you, Michael, appreciate that. Um, that was a great transition. We started to talk a little bit more about trans transition to transmission. So um, where does the energy come from and energy go? I will pass the mic on now to Robert Vosper. You can talk a little bit more of that perspective from a transmission industry. Thank you, Amy. <clears throat> Thank you, Eric. Um, just a, a brief summary on my background here. Um, as Amy noted, I do live in Platteville and have lived here for a number of years. Um, um, I was based here uh, when I worked for Lion Energy for about 12, 15 years in that time frame. But actually, I, I've been working in the electric utility business for about 45 years now. And 25 years of that uh, time has been spent on large renewable energy projects um, around the country and even internationally in Africa and Southeast Asia and some in South America. Um, <clears throat> then I'm um, interested in Interestingly, for the Montfort Wind Farm, I had worked with FPL Energy at that time to get that project actually interconnected to the grid. And, and that 30 megawatt project was quite a project at that time, but pales in comparison to what we're talking about today, as, as Michael and Cooper have noted. Um, but the last seven years, I've been focused more on the regulatory side of, uh, of uh, of the uh, utility business. And I represent the Louisiana Public Service Commission ahead of MISOR, Midwest Independent System Operation, Operator, or as MISOR as we call it for short. That's, and then um, and part of that uh, organization, Louisiana Public Service Commission does belong to the organization of MISOR states, which is a, uh, a organization of 15 states the regulators in that state each have representative in that organization. And currently I chair the transmission planning and work, work group for that organization, which um, has a lot of input and say into how the transmission system will expanded in, in the MISO footprint. So um, a little bit on the transmission in this, this region, um, Amy had mentioned the Cardinal Hickory line. Um, that line was planned about 10, 11 years ago. It was scheduled to be in service by now. It, it's not actually delayed by a lot of years because it's, it wasn't scheduled to start for about five or six years after it was approved in 2011. 
And uh, that, that project had uh, two purposes. Uh, first and foremost, it was to provide stability to the system, the transmission system, because we retired the two, two coal plants at Cassville. And without those coal plants, it was hard to maintain the, the grid in a stable manner. So that line will probably be in service sometime at the end of this year, early next year. I'm not quite sure on that. And then um, there's other lines that are that will be considered in this region. Um, there on paper, there has been some discussion about a new 345 kV line, i.e., a, a, a similar line to the Cardinal Hickory that'll start in Rochester, Minnesota, come to Montford, and then head on down into Illinois. Um, but uh, there's a lot of discussion on transmission expansion. Obviously, MISO, you know, last year it approved $10 billion in new uh, transmission infrastructure in that 15-state footprint. And that their next study now that's underway right now that they're contemplating, that'll be $25 billion. And that'll be uh, the 2024 timeframe before they get through that study. So there's a, a lot of activity on that front. There's going to be a lot of... Uh, discussion about um, ultimately, you know, who, who's going to pay for all the infrastructure and how that'll all play out. So that that that's that's what I had right now, Amy and Eric. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. All right. The last but not least speaker is going to be Andrew Kell from Renew Wisconsin to talk more broadly about the context of Wisconsin's energy future. And Andrew, we have passed the mic to you. Thank you. And I'm going to share some slides here. Amy, can you see the slides on your screen? Great. Okay. Thank you for the introduction, Amy. And uh, I'm Andrew Kell. I'm a policy director with Renew Wisconsin. And today I'm hoping to bring a lot of context to uh, what the speakers already uh, talked about today. And in particular, I want to talk about a recent uh, zero carbon study that Renew Wisconsin helped put together and collaborated with other entities. Um, Amy was talking about the origin of Renew, so just for a little background, uh, Renew was founded in 1991, so we celebrated our 30th anniversary back in 2021, so it's uh, been um, functioning for about 32 years now, and we collaborate, educate, and advocate for renewable energy across the state of Wisconsin. Um, so yeah, the, first of all, with regards to the zero carbon uh, study, we um, collaborated with Evolved Energy Research, provided the modeling work with uh, Grid Lab as well as Clean Wisconsin to develop scenarios for a zero carbon future by 2050 for the state of Wisconsin. And in particular today, I'm gonna to focus on one scenario. It's the net zero economy wide scenario, which means not only cleaning up the electric grid, but all sectors of the economy, including transportation and building uh, electrification as well. So that will um, cause some really interesting results with regards to renewable energy development in, in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, I put the link up there where you can find documents associated with our study. I'll also show that link uh, towards the end of my presentation as well, but you can find it on our uh, renewwisconsin.org website. So one of the main assumptions for a uh, net zero economy wide by 2050 is the electrification of all transportation and building sectors in the state of Wisconsin. And for that, we usually use the term beneficial electrification, meaning that it's what we call load growth on the demand side, but it's something in which we are electrifying resources that cannot uh, decarbonize on their own, such as uh, cars. We have a hard time currently decarbonizing gasoline for uh, carbon emission reductions, as well as uh, natural gas and propane and other fossil fuel resources to heat and, and possibly cool uh, buildings in the state of Wisconsin. So heat pump technologies, electric vehicles, and other technologies as well will be used to uh, have beneficial electrification for the, for the state of Wisconsin by, by 2050 in this model scenario. That's important because once we start to look at the model results, we see from an end user perspective, over 166% load growth on the demand side, meaning you look at uh, 2022 right now, uh, there's about 17.4 gigawatts of nameplate capacity to serve Wisconsin's load. That's a billion watts of generating capacity 
mostly fossil fuel based coal and natural gas, but some wind and solar and other resources as well. But by the time we get to 2050 and we electrify all vehicles and all buildings, we'll see, like I said, 166% load growth by the year 2050, which is primarily driven not to just growth of our existing end uses, but those the uh, transportation and building sectors primarily as well. So on the right-hand side, we're looking at the supply side growth, which is actually about five times growth by 2050. And that's due to what's called capacity factors and the ability for um, solar to generate electricity when the sun is shining, the wind, when the wind is blowing, et cetera, and to have um, clean, clean gas storage and other clean energy resources as well. So the one other slide that I really wanted to show is this diversified clean energy portfolio that this study really resulted in for the state of Wisconsin. So we see quite a huge expansion of solar and wind in the state of Wisconsin, as well as that is imported, um, mostly from our neighboring states of Minnesota, Iowa, and Illinois, where transmission will have to be built as uh, Robert was talking about shortly ago. And one thing, that, and uh, to note as well is storage. So 6.8 gigawatts of storage, the model assumed, would be needed to support the grid resources uh, that are variable in nature based on, again, when the sun is shining and the wind is blowing. So these storage resources will provide a balancing um, service for the grid to make sure that regardless of when you turn on your light switch or air conditioner or whatever, you charge your electric vehicle, that there will be power to serve those energy needs of the future. Uh, and the one thing that's very interesting is right now, I think we're familiar with lithium ion batteries. Um, some recent articles have come out about um, uh, iron, uh, iron air uh, storage capacity, which is being developed in Minnesota and Colorado. And with regards to uh, mining facilities, historical mining facilities, there's a possibility of those being converted for energy uh, storage in the future. I'm not a technology uh, experts, so I can't talk about the feasibility of that in the future, but that is something um, we talk about the, the mining museum and the, uh, the mining uh, resources that have been um, that have been mined in the past in the state of Wisconsin. There's a possibility for those resources to be utilized once again in our clean energy economy of, of the future. So that's really all I have today for the uh, talking about our, our net zero um, study. I'm happy that to talk about um, study a little bit more in the context as we answer Q&A here in the future. And here again is where you can find some documents associated with our zero carbon study uh, on renewwisconsin.org. With that, I'm going to stop sharing my slides and turn it back over to Amy. Thanks, Andrew. Um, thank you, everybody, for those really wonderful but brief introductions. Um, so here's a part of the talk where we get to dive a little bit more into some Q&A and questions. I'm seeing a lot of questions come in already. Um, please continue to add to questions. I'm going to launch. I'm going to I'm going to start off our Q&A with a, a fairly easy one that we've already started to ask a little bit or answer a little bit about. But how come this is happening here? So. Are, is Southwest Wisconsin, first part, is Southwest ex Wisconsin experiencing more renewable energy projects or larger renewable energy projects than elsewhere in the state or country? How relative is the growth here compared to other places in the country and state? Does anybody want to launch in with an answer to that? I, I can feel that and I'm sure a few people can follow suit. Uh, so the Southwest Wisconsin area is, a, is a, one, it's a, it's a beautiful wind resource state. So when we're talking about wind development, there's unique things when it comes to solar, sun shines everywhere. How the sun shines, depending on you know, how close to the, the equator it is, you get better resources and better, better production. But when it comes to wind, wind is very specific. It only is in certain areas. So Southern with uh, the Southwest Wisconsin is one of those areas where the wind blows. Anybody who lives here knows it. And uh, it blows consistently at a certain rate that is really, it's really conducive to wind development. And so is Southwest Wisconsin receiving a little bit more priority than other places? Yes, it is. It has better wind resources available to it. There's other resources available across the country that are very similar, and those are being investigated too. So I can't 
say that Eastern Wisconsin or Wisconsin is unique. There's a lot of wind development and a lot of targeted wind development across the country that's going on right now as we speak. Yeah, I think uh, I would tack on to that. There's a couple other things that I know um, Pattern and Venergy as developers that we're looking for when we're you know, beyond the resource, we're looking for somewhere to um, plug in the power that we're gonna be generating from the wind farm. So if you've got a good wind resource, you need a place to interconnect it. So um, we're looking for substations, um, transmission lines that will give us access to markets. So that's another key feature. And then probably the most important is uh, like community acceptance. So if you've got these good pieces on the front end, if you don't have the people that support it on the ground, then you won't have a, a place to site your facilities. And what we have found here in Southwest Wisconsin are farmers that are eager to look at the opportunity to harvest the wind or farm the sun to uh, shore up their operations. And so they have uh, agreed with voluntary easements to work with us and to site the facilities. So I think those are other pretty critical contributing factors here. Yeah, this this is Robert. I'd like to add a couple um, aspects here. Um, first and foremost, um, for the utility side, it's the economics because why they can get lower cost renewable energy from outside Southwest Wisconsin, um, they've been stung pretty bad with congestion coming in with wind coming in from Western Minnesota, Western Iowa and, and out, out into Dakotas. So there, there's been more of a focus to have uh, wind and, and especially solar located within their footprint or as we call Wisconsin's generally local LRZ2. And um, what that does is it removes the risk of congestion on the system away from the uh, rate payer. So that that's that that is a value to them. The second thing is, as both Michael and Cooper noted, is the ability to interconnect to the grid with um, Cardinal Hickory Creek coming in. Now, with the projects under study and the projects planned by Michael and Cooper's company, that line's going to be pretty well tapped out pretty soon. So until there's another outlet for that generation, there might be some uh, temporary enough uh, renewable energy added in, in this region. Andrew, would you like to add anything to this topic? Sure, sure. I'll just add a little um, historical context. So uh, the first utility scale growth of renewable energy really came about in the 2000s after the passage of the Renewable Portfolio Standard, which mandated a certain percentage from all electric utilities in the state of Wisconsin to get their energy from renewable resources. At that time, wind was the most economic, and a lot of utilities in the state of Wisconsin, like Alliant and mg and &E and Wee Energies, were able to uh, either develop or purchase energy from projects in Iowa, for example, which has a very good uh, wind regime, as well as Minnesota and the Dakotas. And some wind, wind development obviously occurred in the state of Wisconsin as well. Um, more recently, the utilities have all met their RPS requirements, but now have their own net zero um, goals by, by 2050. Just voluntarily, they see where um, the economy is going. They see where the economics of renewable resources are going and they're making investments in renewable resources. So most recently in the five years or so, solar has uh, really become an economic resource and utilities have partnered with developers such as uh, those featured today to uh, develop renewable resources in the state of Wisconsin, uh, uh, mostly in solar and battery storage. But now we're, we're starting to see wind once again with regards to um, inner tie uh, opportunities and with regards to balancing opportunities as well. And, and perhaps, you know, Robert could talk about changing MISO dynamic on, on needs for um, capacity in the winter time, for example, but uh, in, that, in that, for example, wind has a better capacity to serve uh, load in the winter time, whereas in the summertime, oftentimes solar has a good capacity to serve load. So that diversity of renewable resources really coming to uh, flourish now. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, everybody. Um, I'm seeing a lot of questions come through. Oh, chat, come through the chat. May I, Eric, or did, or did you have to jump? Did you have something to jump in on? Yeah, if you don't mind, let me uh, go ahead and uh, kick off some of these, the Q and A. Um, so here's a quick question, if I might, um, 
for renew energy. Um, let's if, let's talk a little bit about funding, if we might. Um, one is our speaker last week um, was telling uh, us about a uh, what he described as a huge fire hose of federal funding uh, coming through uh, the United States uh, through grants um, in the in the next couple of years. I'm wondering uh, how uh, uh, Wisconsin might uh, benefit from some of that how Renew Wisconsin in particular uh, might be benefiting from any of these uh, federal funding for uh, new research and development of uh, energy resources. And then in general, what are the other kinds of funding sources? In, in particular, Barb is asking uh, if uh, Renew accepts money from utilities, for example. So I, I guess I could start off. Um, so with regards to uh, federal uh, legislation that passed recently, uh, oftentimes called Bill in IRA, uh, infrastructure, bipartisan infrastructure uh, legislation, as well as uh, inf um, Inflation Reduction Act, essentially extended existing uh, solar and wind tax credits for not only uh, utilities and developers, but also end users as to install solar on their own rooftops, for example. So there was some uncertainty for quite a while as those tax incentives were, were targeted to sunset uh, in the next couple of years, but now they have been extended due to uh, federal legislation. And beyond that, there are additional incentives to install uh, heat pumps and to install or to have electric vehicles and chargers for electric vehicles that are made available. So we're, we're learning all about um, the funding opportunities that will come about from those pieces of federal legislation. There will be grant opportunities as well. Um, so Renew Wisconsin, for example, we aren't developers ourselves, we're more advocates before the Public Service Commission, uh, working with uh, legislators and uh, organizations across the state of Wisconsin. We do sometimes have some collaboration opportunity in certain grant projects that are educational in nature, but we don't uh, make the, the investments ourselves at Renew Wisconsin. And I think there was also kind of a take on question about uh, Renew's uh, revenue. Uh, where we get our money. So uh, we have some grants, we have membership base, um, and we were able to uh, balance our, our resources um, with a, a lot of grants that are provided members that uh, join both residential members and business members. Uh, we have utilities that, um, you know, support some of um, our, our summit, for example, but a lot of our, our membership base are uh, installers and developers of renewable resources. Great, you guys touched on this a little bit before, but could you just speak a little bit more to um, why are industrial wind turbines being built in southwestern Wisconsin? And then are there some other utilities planning other transmission lines uh, to southwestern Wisconsin, for example, between Montfort and Monroe uh, Beloit? And, and where's this power gonna go? Well, Eric, perhaps I could address at least the transmission aspect. Um, as I noted before, and, and you know, last year a project was put forth for consideration that would extend from Rochester, Minnesota, down through uh, Montfort, and then on down through Monroe and into Illinois, a large line. Um, as I also noted before, um, you know, at some point in time with, it looks at least like the projects that are planned at this time or under study could fully subscribe that existing Cardinal Hickory line. So, you know, this line that would come from Rochester through through Montford and on down into Illinois, um, MISO's on their next study here, that project at least didn't make the initial cut. So when that would occur is, is, is unknown at this time, but that would be the, um, only significant transmission line that be coming through with Southwest Wisconsin. Now there may be some consideration to rebuilding the line, the existing line from Cassville over to Monroe and on to um, Beloit area or, Rock, or Janesville area, I should say. And also a line from Cassville that goes up through uh, Spring Green and on up into central Wisconsin. But um, I'm not sure how that would play out or if that will actually transpire. So. As far as transmission in the region, that's kind of a picture right now as, as what we're seeing with MISO, who's, who's responsible for the planning.
Um, we have a couple of folks asking about um, wind turbines in particular. Um, uh, one person, Barb, is asking uh, if you could speak to uh, health issues uh, that might be involved with uh, wind turbines. Another, uh, Roberta is asking about uh, matters such as infrasound, flicker, or visual pollution that uh, that um, affects uh, quality of life. Uh, does it, can anyone speak to that? And if there are possibilities of mitigating those elements. Sure, I'll I'll wade into this one. Um, yeah, definitely um, questions that we field across the state, um, developing wind and solar projects. Um, I think the, the quickest answer is that there's been 20 years of research on the impact of wind on human health and the potential impacts. It includes studies that would um, investigate infrasound or impacts to human health and when constructed properly at the permitting authorities approved setback distances, we do not we do not have a human health impact that negatively impacts or risks human health um, with you know regard to proximity to turbines. Again, that's why the state process, we didn't really talk about the regulatory side, but Wisconsin's got a very robust state regulatory um, procedure here for large scale wind and solar projects that includes investigating um, environmental and human health impacts. And I think we've seen that bear out over the past five years with a lot of the solar projects that have come before the commission and the wealth of information that has been um, brought to the public's knowledge on that technology. And wind has been here for a, a bit longer. And we've, you know, there's hundreds of peer reviewed studies that I think um, we could point folks toward. And if there's a way to share resources after this call, we'd be happy to get some more detailed information on each of those subjects. And I, I echo uh, Cooper's statements on that. With the 20 years of research, it really is, you know, they've gone so far as to even d dive into to the studies related to, to the effects on animals too. And we would be happy to share those type of resources and point them in direction. So uh, they're out there. Those studies are out there and support the, the fact that Wisconsin has really built a, a great structure around uh, human health. And it's a really big deal to make sure that we do the right thing in the, in the, the overall health and perspective of, of us. Uh, we live with it. We uh, we deal with it on a regular basis. Now, also one of the questions I think Red was also targeted towards, you know, why commercial turbines? Uh, the turbines that are also being built take into account some of those studies and that that health effect long term. And so that's something that uh, is also uh, our goal is to also put some of these larger turbines up. It creates a smaller footprint distances those things further apart and in essence can still generate the same same wind and same generation capacity as the older turbines that were placed close together and, and littered the landscape. In, in this, this is Robert again and this is more of a, a response for Michael and Cooper to answer from, from what I've been hearing in southwest Wisconsin because what some of my farms are located next to the, the wind turbine expansions that are occurring now but the concerns I've been hearing is is you know will, will shadow, shadow flicker be mitigated uh, 87 60 hours of the year um, on the farmstead slash residences and the second of I item is what about your eagle take permits or how you're handling the eagles because of the number of eagles that moved into the region? Yeah, we, we like to call our project boundaries and the project area study area because we, um, as developers, invest a lot of, uh, a lot of money uh, informing ourselves about where we want to propose turbines. The state has guidelines that we've got to follow for shadow flicker, as you mentioned. So mitigation is required um, at certain um, thresholds. So we're not allowed to, the state of Wisconsin is not allowed to permit um, over 30 hours of shadow flicker and mitigation happens at 20 hours. So the state's um, looking into that guidance already. And there's typically two years of avian use studies and eagle use and distribution. You, you brought up eagles. We want to make sure that we're having no impact to 
uh, avian species in the area, not only eagles, but other raptor species. So we spent about two years uh, studying where their activity is and ensuring that we are setting back turbines from them as well as residences and other, um, other infrastructure in the, in the communities where we're developing. Yeah, and, and Bob, more, more directly as well, for Pattern's perspective, we, we all take that same standard of whatever the, the standard is set by the state or set by the federal government when it comes to the avian studies, the bat populations, you know, all of those different things are taken into account whenever we are placing a, a turbine. And those studies, we usually extend those studies beyond the, the minimums. And we also share that detail and share that information with the, the local entities to, to not just benefit ourselves, but benefit flight paths, to benefit you know, emergency medical transports. Those type of things to take into account, not just what we do and how we build things out, but also the overall effect of everybody moving in the, in the environment. Um, shifting gears a little bit here, do you mind if we speak a bit about um, the uh, Cardinal uh, Hickory uh, line? So now we've got a couple of folks asking some related questions. I'll kind of uh, hit on a few of them here. Uh, it looks like Sun Zia, Dina says, uh, was a hotly contested uh, 500 megawatt high voltage transmission like line project that uh, threatens several sensitive areas. Cardinal Hickory Creek has also been hotly contested with uh, three federal lawsuits. There's a number of concerns about why what Dina calls uh, outdated steel in the ground technologies are still being pushed in lieu of low voltage alternatives. Um, and uh, similar, so Mary is uh, saying there's uh, been some opposition to Cardinal Hickory Creek line and it's her understanding there, there's still uh, a couple of court cases pending and that it hasn't received a permit to cross the Mississippi. Um, I know, was it uh, Robert who was speaking a little bit about uh, um, thinking that the line would be going forward in the next year or, or, or so, and they're wondering what the basis would be for optimism given the pending legal cases and community challenges. Yeah, th this is Robert. You know, it would be hard to. I, I know I'm and very familiar with those uh, lawsuits that are going on, but it would be um, at some point in time, it would it would seem that some type of agreement slash settlement would be reached on that um, because of the investment in um, first of all for stability of the electrical grid because of the coal plants re retiring over at Cassville. Second of all, not only the investment in the transmission line, but uh, that's been done so far, but also all the investment is such as what Michael and Cooper's companies are making. So it'd be really hard, at least in my view, to turn that back at this time. But looking forward, is transmission outdated? I, I'm, I, don't, I wouldn't say it's outdated, but I, I think, in, in at least from the regulator standpoint and the MISO viewpoint, we, we just feel, and, and Andrew can probably address this more, is that there needs to be more dis distributed ener energy resources, or DER as we call them. And, they're in, and the Inflation Reduction Act had quite a, quite a focus too on energy efficiency, and, and Andrew noted this too as heat pumps. Um, at least from ISO standpoint, you know, they're only looking at through 2040, maybe across the, all of Wisconsin, maybe 700 megawatts of DER. And I, I think there's a general consensus, at least among the regulators, that there has to be a greater focus on these distributed energy resources slash energy efficiency. And I can, I, can, I can also step in and speak to, you know, yes, there's litigation out there uh, related to, you know, where, where transmission lines go. And oftentimes those, those transmission lines and have developed, you know, specifically, I can speak to Senzia. I can't speak to Cardinal Hick Hickory Creek because I'm not involved in that litigation. I don't know it and, and would not pretend to know it. Uh, but when it comes to walking around and going through sensitive areas as, uh, as were out, outlined in the question, the idea is to find a solution. And not always is everything perfect, but to find a workable solution that ultimately gets the end goal of not just getting energy where it's needed, but reinforcing the grid like Robert had stated, 
uh, you know, building it stronger to where we don't have the outages and we don't have the issues that are going. Our grid is outdated. It is outdated by years, not just by, you know, a couple of years, but we're talking tens of years in most cases. So having the reliability factor of being able to go in and turn a lights on and do it, you know, knowing that there are areas of our country that are highly protected and beautiful uh, wildlife, so being able to get through those areas in a fashion that not only finds a solution, but ultimately contributes to the longevity of those areas as well. And that's what the, those solutions ultimately wind up finding is, is some medium ground. Is everybody happy? No. But is the majority being solved and is a longer term solution put in place to get through those areas in a way that is conducive and also supports the wildlife and supports the whatever else is happening in that specific environment? The answer is yes. And most companies, whether it's Invenergy, whether it's Pattern or others out in the community that do this, that's a really big focus uh, is, is building through those communities and being cognizant of how to do it in an effective way and how to do it the right way. And that's, uh, that's about the best we can do. And also we, we leverage the knowledge we have at the time. Uh, years ago when the Army Corps of Engineers drew on a map and said, this is a great path for where a, a power line could go well, that's not necessarily the case now as we build out and as we continue to, to develop in the communities. So we have to be cognizant of that and adjust where needed. Thanks, Michael. And, and uh, Robert brought up distributed energy resources. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that. Um, so yeah, Renew Wisconsin is about all the above renewable energy resources. We concentrate a lot of our efforts towards the development of distributed generation resources such as solar on, on rooftops. Um, and when it comes to cases before the Public Service Commission that go into like pricing, for example, the buyback rates for customers to get when they export excess energy onto the grid, what's the appropriate price for that? So uh, Renew Wisconsin, we went toe to toe with utilities because utilities want to suppress the prices as much as possible so that customers would get paid as little as possible. I put in forward uh, expert testimony and exhibits to convince the commission otherwise so that the true value of solar could be reflected and buyback rates could be sufficient enough to drive as much distributed generation at the distribution level as possible. Um, so that being said, the, the commission pretty much took the utilities proposals and there's been an improvement now in 2023 for buyback rates, especially above and beyond net metering. Uh, but there's still a lot of work to do, and that's a lot of uh, the work that I do in Renew in Wisconsin in particular, trying to put forward policies before, especially the Public Service Commission, to make sure that pricing policies support distributed generation penetration as high as possible in the state. Um, and just referencing our, our study one more time, um, the study really, with regards to assumptions for distributed generation, solar rooftop in, in particular by 2050, leveraged a solar potential study that Cadmus had provided for focus on energy previously. And that extrapolated not only the technical potential, but then the economic potential for rooftop solar in the state of Wisconsin. You go to 2050, it gets to 2.5 gigawatts of solar. And hopefully we can go above and beyond that. But at, at this point in time, that's the expected maximum potential of roof, rooftop solar penetration by 2050. And that's in the context of needing um, over 75 gigawatts of, um, you know, clean energy uh, capacity by by 2050. So uh, we, we want to maximize uh, resources at the distribution level, including energy efficiency, demand side management, everything that involves um, customers participating in the democratization of energy. But at the end of the day, if we're serious about climate change, we need to leverage uh, resources at the utility scale, the transmission level, as well as resources at the distribution level to get to zero carbon emissions by 2050. Um, you were bringing up uh, solar there. Uh, a couple of questions coming in about, uh, so Chuck and Karen ask us uh, if you could comment on the role of energy efficiencies. Um, so we're speaking of large scale projects, but um, you were touch, touched on this a bit, but can't uh, private distributed, uh, such as rooftop solar and energy efficiencies, play a significant role? Some similar vein here, Roberta's 
asking uh, why more solar panels aren't being installed over heat sink parking lots and existing buildings, recognizing that uh, as power is lost, the farther it travels, um, why, why aren't we building more infrastructure close to where the power is being used rather than out here in rural areas? That first part sounds like an Andrew question. I feel yeah. like the, when I hear 2.5 gigawatts of rooftop, my brain goes nuts. I mean, that is that is a huge, huge number. And I think that that is a significant investment. But you also mentioned the top line number too, right, Andrew? Yeah, that's right. And um, again, Renew Wisconsin, we have, we run on behalf of other organizations, uh, distributed solar incentive programs, one for the city of Madison called Madison, and then for uh, Coyard Solar Foundation, a solar for good, which invests for uh, nonprofits and places of worship that um, you know don't have a, um, a full profit or capital means to make investments in solar, have incentives for them to develop um, you know, solar to, uh, as well as an energy efficiency uh, package, right? You want to reduce your footprint as much as possible as far as your energy use, and then generate electricity at the source of a load as much as possible in, in, the, in the name of efficiency. However, in, in the modern uh, society that we live in, we, we drive cars, we fly planes, we live in buildings that need heating, cooling throughout the year. The load is there. And once we electrify all of those sectors, the, the demand for renewable energy resources will be needed at all levels. So we want to maximize uh, those resources at the distribution level and those bill and IRA let pieces of legislation will provide legis will provide incentives to make that happen. But at the same time, there is technical uh, limitations uh, for those installations ultimately as well. Can I jump in on this one too as uh, an answer? Um, so a couple of comments on the rooftop solar. I think that's such a lovely question. We did install solar on my roof back in 2017. And um, one of the things that you need to consider when you're calculating solar on your roof is the angle of your roof and if there's trees or other objects blocking the sun. So um, I, we have a roof that's not quite at the right angle, but we did manage to install 7 kW of solar on our roof, which is about what we needed to run our house, except now that we've added electric cars, we now use more solar than obviously we produce and we might need to add more solar panels, which means we might need to add ground mount at that point or do something different. So from a personal standpoint, um, I can speak from experience that not every roof is angled correctly. And I believe that's part of the calculation and the renew analysis as well, that it was actually, maybe if I recall correctly, Andrew, it was only maybe 20% of roofs in Wisconsin. It was much less than I expected that were angled in a way that maximized solar production. And so that's one calculation or one consideration as we're talking about rooftop solar, because I think it's likely that I'm gonna assume all panelists here would like to see that type of solar going in when possible, that that rooftop solar home owned, owned by owners, so they can, they can save the money on their electricity bill is obviously one of the best ways to be doing this. The other half of that then is the, why aren't we installing solar over parking lots? Because that again would be another way to maximize our land use. When we worked at UW-Platteville to assess where we could put a solar project, uh, we did calculate, we worked with, we got quotes on many different solar projects and we looked at putting them over parking lots as well. And one of the, you know, realizations is that the economics of building solar panels that are mounted taller change significantly from maybe a 10 year payback or 15 year simple payback for these types of projects closer to 30 to 40. So as a state agency, we couldn't justify at that time paying for those types of different installation costs. Now, hopefully with time, hopefully, I don't know right now is a weird economy, but hopefully with time, some of those costs can come down and doing solar over parking lots can become a little bit more of a better payback for people. But that was one of the reasons UW Platteville did not put solar over their parking lot was that the type of mounting that you would need was significantly more expensive than others. Rooftop solar also was significantly more expensive in that case for us at the time. 
Amy, as follow up to that, just a point of interest about three, four years ago, I was heavily involved with Michigan State and we put uh, solar over all their parking lots. So that investment, I noticed when that happened and I always thought that was an amazing investment that they made yeah. as an institution. I'm not sure how they financed it, but do you know, Robert? Like, was it, they must have used some foundation funds and other, I'm not sure. I'd have to look at go back and look at my notes, but it, it was was effective. And Andrew, I think on the rooftop solar where we see the biggest benefits is the large distribution systems, the large large facilities that have a lot of roof space. At least from my my standpoint, what I've been seeing and hearing and, and watching is is that's where most of that rooftop solar is really occurring, where you're getting the biggest, biggest bang for the buck. Yes, and we're all about maximizing, you know, whether it be apartment buildings, commercial and industrial facilities, or small residential houses and uh, multi-unit uh, complexes as well, um, utilizing solar space where, where available, where technically feasible, where the sun is, is shining at a, at a decent uh, solar window throughout the duration of, of the day and the, and the season. And so that's something that's baked into that Cadmus potential study was looking at. First of all, money aside, what is the technical potential for utilizing all the rooftop space that, that can be utilized uh, in the state of Wisconsin? And second of all, considering pricing and policies such as net metering, such as sub metering, such as policies in place right now that are meant to have some obstacles for uh, customers to install distributed generation, we need to remove that. We need to truly value uh, rooftop solar. Once we align those policies in the state of Wisconsin, we get to that um, 2.5 gigawatts by by 2050 installation, uh, which is hopefully we can get to that if not not uh, further by by uh, a few decades from now. Okay, Amy and panelists, here, here's a couple more quick uh, solar related questions. Uh, taking it out of the urban context and out into a rural area. Um, thinking about soils and uh, native plants and so forth. Tom and Kay ask, how is plant and weed growth managed beneath the solar panels? And then Dina is asking about uh, terraforming and uh, how that may have been used at Badger Hollow so uh, Solar and how that may have impacted uh, soils and, and what can be done in the future to, pre to prevent destruction of soil in the driftless area. Hey there. So um, the picture behind me is Badger Hollow in uh, full growth in the summer from 2021. I was out there with DNR, but uh, I, I think this is just a great example of the investment that um, Invenergy is making on ground cover strategies that are aimed to nourish and build soils in the communities. These farm fields we're renting built the businesses that they're leasing land to host solar on. Now, so being good stewards of um, what's happening on the ground beneath our arrays was priority number one. Um, at Badger Hollow, that was the first thing any landowner wanted to know what we were going to do. Um, so what we've done is establish a matrix of sedge, uh, grass, prairie, pollinator species that are regionally appropriate here, that are aimed to be low growing, but also outcompete out invasive species. There um, is annual mowings and then spot herbiciding that happens as well to ensure that if, you know, the errant noxious weed crops up that we are addressing it beneath the arrays to ensure we are fulfilling that promise. The deep rooted species we're selecting, again, are going to be retaining a lot of the nutrients runoff from neighboring farms, preventing that from going into local waterways. Um, it's part of the Invenergy impact that we think we're delivering cleaner air, cleaner soils, and cleaner water with a solar project that's emission-free. Um, I, I think the second question was more about grading and how, um, how to mitigate impacts from that. Um, we can't grow what we're, we're growing here unless we're doing a very careful job segregating topsoil from subsoils when we do have to grade. Solar is very particular. Farmers like flat, dry land. Um, so do uh, photon farmers. So undulation is something we've got to take care of. So in the construction process, we make sure that we separate the topsoil and bring the topsoil back on the same land so we can continue growing 
And ultimately at the end of the life of the project, when we decommission, we can return the land in as good or better condition as when we found it, again, with deep rooted species um, and a, you know, effectively a solar prairie growing beneath the arrays. Um, we are building soils and we are nourishing them for the life of the project and returning something that's um, highly valuable to the farmers when we pull out our stakes and decommission the project. The, I know a question that comes up a lot is about decommissioning. Um, my understanding is your solar is being drilled in like a, a pole just being drilled into the ground. It's not concrete. So what would decommissioning look like? Yeah, so we are bound by our easements with our landowners, as well as the state of Wisconsin to uh, create a decommissioning plan um, when we're proposing projects like Badger Hollow. So um, that not only do we have uh, detailed information about how we're gonna remove facilities, but have um, finances in place in order to do that, like a letter of credit or um, some other form of surety, like a bond. So what we've, told the Public Service Commission at Badger Hollow is we're gonna remove all infrastructure um, at down to four feet below grade. And the piles that you're mentioning here, they're, they're like steel I-beams, they get pile driven into the earth and then we pull them straight back out of the earth. And that's the, uh, that's the simple process um, for removing that piece of equipment. What, would there be anything below four feet? So you said that you have to move everything to four feet. That's right. So we're trying to we're going to pluck the uh, we're going to be plucking the uh, piles themselves out. There is like distribution uh, medium voltage cable that may be abandoned in place. Again, it's a question of like value of salvage and what it looks like at the end of the project. Does it make sense to pull it out and to sell it, or is it a greater impact to pull out underground cabling um, and all of that? So we give ourselves a little bit of flexibility in the decommissioning plan um, for that particular piece. Amy, did you want to speak any more about solar before we shift gears a little bit and talk about uh, wind again? I'm good. The only thing I might recommend or offer as a resource for the group attending, if anybody has been considering solar at their own house, a resource that I really appreciated is called PV Watts Calculator. It's online, a website, pvwatts.nrel.gov, and you can go on into a mapping application and literally look at your roof and draw a shape around where you might wanna put solar and it can help you calculate what size solar array you can fit where you're, where you're looking at. And that's a really nice tool that if you are thinking about putting solar on your roof, you can use it when you get quotes to kind of compare what you, the different bids are coming in at compared to with what you're learning from looking at that website yourself. So it's, uh, we've got a question here, um, a few questions that deal with um, why uh, southwestern Wisconsin is a good location for uh, wind farming. And uh, there might be some geographic reasons. Um, another factor that might play into this might be economic or cultural reasons. Uh, Barb asks, um, if, uh, you know, why, why Wisconsin, why southwestern Wisconsin? And, and here's an interesting question. Our, are lower income counties targeted because um, farmers need financial payments? That's a that's a great question, and uh, the answer is, and I and I said it earlier is, wind is is specific. Uh, wind doesn't work everywhere uh, across the country. Uh, just like there's waters and there's streams and there's lakes and there's, you know, the creeks and all those things, they're in certain areas across the country uh, and the higher concentration in some than others. Uh, the wind works very similarly. In southwest Wisconsin, the wind is beautiful and it's, and it's beautiful for wind generation. Uh, it's something that southwest Wisconsin just has that. That is one of the assets that it has that we can leverage for not only the good of, you know, the electrical grid and, and the state, but at a local level, uh, at an individual farm level as well. Uh, Cooper had mentioned it earlier is, you know, having a separate line of income 
to support farming. It makes one, farming a lot easier. And two, it, it keeps these multi-generational farms in the family uh, because it creates another line of revenue that continues to support uh, you know, farming and, and that development uh, outside of farming. So there's, you know, our low, lower level communities targeted for that. No, it's really where the wind is. If the wind is good, then that's where you look. And so that Southwest Wisconsin, it's just one of those areas that has really good quality wind. And the fact that there's a side benefit that farmers can benefit from it. And long-term uh, there's, there's uh, you know, making things better and easier in the community and hopefully making a good community impact as well and still retain all your farmland for farming or a good majority of it. Uh, you know, wind farms actually take up a minimal, imp, uh, a minimal footprint uh, in the overall energy perspective and energy development perspective. So allowing farmers to still farm the majority of their land while wind is being developed over the top of them, it, it's, it's a really good fit for Southwest Wisconsin. Speaking of some of the community impacts, um, Roberta is uh, asking about uh, local long-term employment. Uh, is is it um, is it possible that some of the claims are uh, a little exaggerated? Um, is or maybe is it going to be maybe a dozen jobs or so per per project? Uh, Barb uh, echoes that question, wondering how many good-paying jobs will be permanent um, in southwestern Wisconsin. Uh, Cooper can probably speak to this as well as I can. The average is, you know, a, an average wind farm or, or solar farm, it, it will need anywhere between five and as many as 20 employees, depending on the size and scope and, and maintenance needs of those projects. Yeah, we're employing uh, five technicians at Badger Hollow right now um, to maintain that 300 megawatt site. Again, it's a I mean, these are these are long term stable jobs that are going to be around for the life of these easements that are high tech and going to mean families in the in the community that are here to um, to work and live and spend money and uh, have an impact in Iowa County. And um, certainly that's part of the, the value proposition of a large wind project compared to some of the other projects that were mentioned that the other generation resource types that are retiring right now, like coal. Um, but yes. Um, speaking of those easement lands, uh, Dina has a couple of questions. Uh, in the wind project lands currently under easement control are Uplands, Badger Hollow, Quilt Block 2, Whitetail, and Red Barn. How much more available wind resource will be left for further development after all those projects come into service? So, uh, meaning, are these projects leaving room for continued development in the in the near future? Uh, I, I the best I can speak to on that is there's still room for development, even with all these projects uh, hopefully being built out. Uh, the reality is, is, yes, there's still room for development. There's still really good quality wind in the area. And it really depends on how the projects are built out that will leave a, a longer impact on what can be developed. And a lot of this is too early to say. Uh, we have not, we, we don't have layouts available for really any of those as of right now. So knowing the, the size of turbine and the uh, the waking effect that they would have on neighboring power plants or power generation for wind, that's uh, yet to be determined. So maybe you've answered this, uh, but um, if you needed to uh, tell us what additional projects might be planned for Southwestern Wisconsin over the next decade, uh, do you have any ideas? I think planned is a, is an interesting word for this. I mean, there, there's certainly a lot of interest in meeting the demand from customers in Wisconsin. Utilities have elected to decarbonize. I think Bob and Andrew touched on this. Um, they wanna be carbon free by 2050, which means they're going to need to transition over the next you know, 30 years or so to, um, to really deliver on that promise. Um, 
And so there are definitely a lot of companies looking to interconnect at different places across Southwest Wisconsin. This is a really complex process. Um, when you're asking, I think Bob mentioned the Midwest independent system operator. They study what happens when you plug in projects at any point on the, on the transmission grid here. And there, I think, are a lot more positions out there that are looking to connect than will ultimately be built. But that's something that is available on, on uh, MISO's website if people are looking for a sense of what are people thinking about today. And my crystal ball is as clear as anybody's on how many of these will ultimately be viable and have the right mix of that low cost of interconnection, community acceptance, good wind resource. Um, and then construction and development fundamentals to actually be built. So tough question to answer. Okay, this one might be easier to answer, a little more nuts and bolts of you. Um, how, uh, could you tell us a little bit about the contracts um, between uh, the company and the landowner? So uh, how many years are the contracts for the, these projects, uh, Steve is asking? Um, what are the landowners guaranteed with the contracts? How do the contracts work kind of in general? For example, if a landowner signs up to, let's say, 200 acres, what might the landowner receive? And, uh, and, and how about the non-participating landowners, maybe neighbors, um, what rights might they have, if any, in the, in the project? Yeah, so from a commercial perspective, I think generally that's as a proprietary question, so I'm not going to be at liberty to share details of like lease rates, but typically lease leases for Invenergy are um, on a solar project. We've got a couple of five years to develop the project with a three-year construction phase and then two 25-year operation terms. And um, farmers can expect to benefit if we do build um, solar facilities on the land, wind contracts are very similar. Um, and then the, the terms are, are varying. It's taking longer to get through that interconnection process. So some of that front end timing is uh, being extended has been my, my experience so far, but um, the back end we're, we're typically looking at a couple of operations terms of 30 years each. So up to 50 or 60 years for, for a project before they would have to um, decommission and be off of the land. And in the meantime, these landowners are going to get a significant hedge against volatile agricultural markets that again, a wind turbine, we like to think of them as like a, an ag implement. It's just a, another piece of equipment that's enabling you to sustain, expand, um, grow your business, your existing operations. Solar is similar. People are looking to put their land in. Um, for many different reasons, uh, typically because farming's tough. There's a lot of smaller farms that are closing across the state of Wisconsin. This has been widely reported and um, the opportunity to farm the sun um, does provide a, a bit of a parachute from you know, having to ultimately sell the land that you may have been farming for five generations over a hundred years. Um, so those, those landowner lease payments are are something that are a major impact to the local community and to farming families and um, have, have a big impact on rural Wisconsin. Okay, we've got a, here's a, a few, here's a philosophical question. Um, and uh, the driftless area, which is this uh, beautiful hilly region where we live, um, has some interesting uh, features. Some of it in, is that there's, uh, it's very agricultural. There's not a lot of uh, modern infrastructure. So the way of life here is simple um, for those who are interested, inspired by nature, um, who are motivated by uh, sweeping natural landscape views, a simple way of life. Um, the, this idea of farmland having a new use, ha, uh, ha, there's some philosophical uh, challenges. And then some, there's some aesthetic challenges, uh, you know, setting aside any discussion of say human health. Um, what about uh, the idea of uh, what would have a higher value than farm fields? 
why why is so why is solar and, or an energy production somehow better than just uh, a, a farm field or uh, or a natural space and uh, and furthermore if you were to build this uh, these structures can we go the extra mile and consider technology Mary Kritz is saying why doesn't MISO and the energy community give more thought to burying transmission lines uh, rather than creating these towers that are a scar in the landscape. Uh, the, the philosophical uh, question is kind of a good one, but it's same, it same one as, you know, I've heard it many times across the country, not just in the MISA region, but taking farmland out of production, it's a difficult, it, that's a difficult task. And to, for anybody that says, yeah, this is better than that, um, that's an opinion for sure, but it really comes down to, as Cooper has said, and, and have I, uh, uh, as I have said, is it's, is it beneficial to not only the community, but to the farmer, the individual themselves? And if it is, then it's a good fit. If it's not, then you move on. And it's really cut and dry as far as I'm concerned. It really is individually based. It is a perspective based off of that landowner whether you know wind development or solar development is financially beneficial to them and their family. Uh, we, we look at it at that level and that's how I believe it should be respected. Uh, knowing that it, it's a long-term setup you know, to where we'd, we're gonna be there for a long time. Uh, wind energy, once it's built out, it's, it will be in play for a long, long time to come. Same with solar. Uh, so knowing the, and understanding the benefits and whether they outweigh the, the, the change up from farmland to energy development, that is definitely individually based and uh, also benefits to the, to the state that itself. You know, you have to look and factor that in as well as does, does it matter uh, where the energy is produced? And the answer is yes. You know, you have to look where the energy can be produced and then look at it and see, you know, is this energy going to be effectively used in our community? And in, if that's a yes as well, then it sure makes it an easier step to say this is a right fit here. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll only add on that, you know, we're not, we're not insens insensitive to the fact that this is a, a change to the existing rural aesthetic and that we, we do recognize that um, in both wind and solar projects, typically there are, it was, I think I forgot to answer this portion of the easement question, but um, participation easement or good neighbor agreements are things that we work with in communities that um, reflect evaluation of folks who are going to look at something different that isn't what they've been looking at, but respects the right for their neighbors to, you know, voluntarily lease the land to a developer to, um, you know, enable a sustainable future for their their business, their operation, their family, um, and then in addition to that, I mean, from a from a solar perspective, we've worked very hard in all of the communities in Wisconsin where we're building solar projects to engage folks to offer vegetative screening. It's a lower profile technology, so that's something we can offer. Um, we want to be available to the wider community to come up with creative solutions to, as Michael said at the very top of this whole thing, to be a good neighbor. We're going to be here long term, and we want to be considered a good partner to the community, not only for the participating landowners, but um, by generating revenues that are being um, deployed to the benefit of the wider community for schools, fire and EMS, infrastructure and road projects. Um, all of our projects, we work with local communities to establish like road use agreements for construction. And I think this really gets to the heart of how are we engaging folks when we are going through the development process that aren't the, the siting of the wind facilities themselves. And there's a, there's a long uh, road in front of any developer that's trying to successfully permit a project in the state of Wisconsin. And it is by building bridges and relationships within those local communities to figure out what is most important to that community and where possible build in um, those rural values into the development itself. At Badger Hollow, we're using ag like deer fencing on the project rather than chain link because when we first came around, it became abundantly clear to us that that was not going to fly in Iowa County. Um, 
We got a lot of pushback internally from estimators, but ultimately we made the case and that is now like, I think pretty industry standard, it's certainly in Venergy standard um, to, to roll with the, you know, six inch wire mesh, deer fence, ag fence, um, you know, in response to communities who have um, specific concerns. So yeah, we wanna work to be a good partner in this community for the long haul. And it starts with having these conversations right now. Just a, another easy one here, following up on your lease, uh, on the lease contracts, um, can the uh, developing companies uh, pass on the lease to say a utility company down the line should the utilities uh, buy out the operation? Yes, in short. And then all of the agreements and everything that we agreed on with the farmers are then the responsibility of any assignee, if it was a utility or otherwise, to be beholden to. So those contracts are, if that's the if that's the structure, then that would be uh, how that'd work for the farmer. Nobody's going to change anything um, after the fact without that farmer signing off on it. Uh, circ circling back to the power lines, um, how feasible is, is it, and ha has how much have the right uh, powers that be discussed the possibility of burying um, transmission lines? Yeah, this is this is Robert um, burying, for example, a Cardinal Hickory Creek is basically not feasible. I mean, if you have if you spend enough money, you can do it, but it's very, very difficult to bury high voltage lines of that magnitude. Now there is a large, because that, because that particular project's alternate current or AC, but there is a large project proposed that is underground, but that's high voltage DC and it's called the Sioux Green Project. And that starts out in Iowa somewhere and, and extends down into the Chicago area, I believe. So. If you're doing it with the DC, it's 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 very expensive, but it's more feasible than doing the AC uh, AC um, type of installation underground. Well, I'm pretty ignorant on this uh, stuff, Robert. Um, why? Uh, who would make the call uh, to transmit AC versus uh, DC, and what are some of the reasons involved there? Well. Um, you know, re really entities such as Michael's, Michael and Cooper's company, you know, they they look at the various projects and see what they feel is most reasonable to do. So I, I, I believe, you know, for example, offshore wind that, you know, obviously those lines are, are, are buried or below, or below the surface until they hit the shore. So, and there are more uh, high voltage lines underground in the, um, especially in the New England area than there are elsewhere in the country. But um, it's an economic decision. Um, you know, you, you can do anything with the, with enough money, but at some point in time, those those economics, you know, you have to you have to make the decision, and generally that's going to be all overhead alternating current lines. Amy, what are some other topics uh, that you uh, were hoping to cover here that we haven't covered so far? And um, though we've answered most of the questions from the public, there's a few left. Um, would you like to to uh, wrap it up, Amy? Yeah, Eric, I think I'd like to end on um, just a personal question for each of our panelists. I, I'd like to ask why, what excites you most about being in this energy industry at this time and this moment in this place? Uh, well, I should pick somebody. I'm going to kick that to you, Robert. Well, I, I've always enjoyed the intellectual aspect of, of my work, even from day one back in the in the seven, 1970s. So, and, and today, I mean, the industry is rapidly changing and, and there's a, a lot of, uh, a, a lot to learn, a lot to know. And um, so that intellectual um, aspect of the work is what keeps me working well past retirement. I'll go next. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I wasn't, I, 
you know, 12 years in Wisconsin, building mostly solar, been in wind, obviously, as well. But it's just incredible to me, like how quickly we're scaling and how different the industry is from 10 years ago, how we're, you know, what we're seeing as far as like community acceptance and reception and the interest from developers and from utilities to invest in these projects has been incredible and mind-blowing when I joined Invenergy and they started talking about like the the pipeline and some of the the goals for visualizing you know where Wisconsin is heading I couldn't believe the math and the numbers and that we were putting G's in front of W's and not M's so I think the scaling size coming from such a small we were a 36 megawatt solar factory building 250 watt panels that's what I that's what I did and we are installing 550 watt modules on a 250 megawatt project in my you know my grandpa's home county in Walworth County Wisconsin and that project starting construction this summer so it has just been pretty much every step of the past three and a half four years um has been this crazy hockey stick that's just been an amazing ride in comparison with the solar coaster of the you know, preceding seven or eight years. So at any rate, very excited to be here and to be a part of this. Thanks, Cooper. Michael, would you like to answer that question? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I I made the, uh, the decision to join the renewable energy business and, and development specifically later in life. You know, I was well into my 40s when I stepped into this with the full knowledge that I wanted to do something that one made a difference and two that I could look at my kids and say I made a difference for you and for your kids that it wasn't just a financially beneficial opportunity for me today but it was a long-term play out uh, across a global landscape that made a difference in my community in my home uh, and that's something that I really thoroughly enjoy and and it's been fun. I've, I've, I'm like Cooper, uh, seeing these things increase exponentially and seeing all of a sudden the gigawatt uh, be a common term, is it's been fun too. It has been a, a lot of fun and I enjoy that. Uh, life is far too short to not enjoy what you get to do. Thanks, Michael. Hey, Andrew, last but not least, you get to be the end of our session today. Well, thank you, Amy. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, it's um, fully addressing the technical challenges of meeting a zero carbon future by, by 2050. To me, that's like, you know, signing up with Kennedy's declaration to get to the moon uh, before the end of the, of, the, of the decade, right? It's a huge technical challenge. It's a huge investment. It's a huge collaboration opportunity, but it is just that. It is something that we can address the challenge. We can make sure that we live sustainably well into the future if we all get together and create this new clean energy economy together. And so it's something that rather than um, say it's something we can't do, it's too difficult, or we're going to need to go back into to caves as far as the economy and not have uh, electricity anymore. We're going to address this full head on and, and uh, develop a clean energy economy together and fully address uh, climate change. Well, may I, I'd like to turn that question on you too, Amy, since you're involved in the industry. Thanks, Eric. Um, it's been great for me to reflect on as part of this panel, what I've liked about it. And so Eric, you mentioned at the beginning, my background was as sustainability coordinator at UW Platteville. And when you work in sustainability, you there's so many different angles on sustainability, right? We did waste reduction, we did landscape management, um, when I started really looking at how we could have the biggest impact on our environmental footprint, it became very clear that energy is one of the most negative impacts on our footprint. So if you can deal with energy in a way that increases or decreases its negative environmental impact, you can really have a big, a big impact overall. Um, and so I, it's been really exciting for me to be on this journey in energy because and working with the university to build a 2.4 megawatt solar array there, we were able to achieve a huge positive environmental impact for that institution. And at the same time, it 
is one of the few projects and aspects of sustainability that I've worked on over the past decade that um, has had a lot of different stars aligning at the same time. And there's a lot of forward motion, a lot of technological changes, a lot of policy changes and social changes that have made this a real opportunity for us in Southwest Wisconsin to improve our environmental impact and potentially quality of life and economics if we're smart about how we do it. And it's been very fun to be on that ride, um, especially along with really smart people. I liked how Robert mentioned that this has been a really intellectual group and I found it very wonderful to learn from so many smart people about why the nuances of energy are playing out the way that they are. It's been a really fun field to be a part of. Well, I get the sense that this subject is huge and the fact that we've tried to tackle all of this in a relatively short um, amount of time um, you know, is going to leave a lot of us uh, with our appetites just barely whetted. I'd like to thank uh, everybody who asked so many great questions. Uh, if there's some questions that we didn't get a chance to answer, I uh, I, I apologize. Um, but, uh, I think that uh, we'll, you know, we're going to have to keep asking some of these questions, I think, over the years um, to try to get a better handle on uh, what's, what's a really large and important subject matter. Um, uh, I believe it was you, Andrew, who was uh, saying uh, that uh, what's what's happening in this field is might be akin to uh, the idea of landing a spacecraft on the moon. And uh, did you know that uh, the Apollo spacecraft, um, its battery uh, was powered as uh, the zinc silver battery uh, was was powered uh, in part by zinc mined right here in southwestern Wisconsin. Uh, and uh, as it happens, uh, uh, Eagle Pitcher, the last mining company in the region um, is still in the battery making industry. So this idea of uh, generating power, power uh, storing uh, power and batteries, transmitting uh, power, these are some interesting uh, topics. And next week, um, 5 p.m. Sunday, March 5th, uh, Winter Lyceum 3 of 7 is going to be uh, engineer Cami Platner presenting Eagle Pitcher's NASA launch silver zinc batteries, the power behind the Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, and Skylab missions. So uh, we hope uh, you'll consider tuning in next week. Uh, um, gentlemen and uh, Amy, thank you ever so much uh, for sharing some of your time and expertise with us tonight. I wish we could uh, have time for more conversation and maybe we will uh, in the future. So uh, thanks uh, so much to you uh, for participating, uh, for, for all of you in the audience. Uh, on behalf of the Mining and Rollo Jamison Museums, good night. Bye now. Thank you. Good evening. Thanks, everybody.